Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19. At this point in the book of Genesis, we have covered several sections and we've given each of those sections some cursory title. We began with in the beginning creation, and in the beginning corruption, in the beginning catastrophe, and then most recently in the beginning calling. We've spent several weeks there in that in the beginning calling. And now for just the next two weeks, we're going to see that there was also something else in the beginning, and that is in the beginning compromise compromise. Compromise, there is something about God's intention, his perfect plan that we have in some way, shape or form diminished. We have settled on something just a little bit less. And then typically just a little bit less than that and a little bit less than that. And and so it goes until we wonder, how did we get to where we are? In the beginning, compromise. And today, the title of our message is Settled in Sodom. Settled in Sodom. How many of you have ever had something like this happen? And it's happened to me on multiple occasions in, in a variety of settings, but this comes to mind. Have you ever had two lights in your refrigerator and one of them goes out? Have you ever had that happen before? Where you open the door and you just can't see things quite as clearly as you used to see. So you open it and you notice right away, like, oh, one of the lights is out and I'll get to that soon. And typically, we, we don't really find a lot of motivation until the other one goes out. There are two types of destruction that oftentimes occur. One is sudden. We might refer to it as cataclysmic. And the other is gradual, almost imperceptible. Of course, the cataclysmic destruction gets the most attention. And that is what is about to happen in Sodom. Cataclysmic destruction. But the gradual decay is, I would submit, no less dangerous in fact, maybe even more so. And that is what is happening moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month. That is what is happening to Lot and to his family. Sometimes we use the word compromised to help us understand that the integrity of something is no longer intact. For example, we say the, the, the integrity of the concrete on the bridge is compromised, and so it's dangerous to drive across it. We might say something like the, the security of the network has been compromised, and hackers found a portal, a way in, so the network is compromised. Again, these things usually happen over time, but the impact of these ongoing and gradual assaults can be equally as devastating as the cataclysmic, sudden event. Today, as we consider this in the beginning compromise, and, and then we look at settled in Sodom, let's begin by looking at the compromise of a saint. The compromise of a saint. And before we get too far into this study, let's remember once again that God viewed Lot as a righteous man. That's 2 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8. Lot is one of those who is numbered with the righteous. But 
so that we're all clear on this and so that we all understand and we don't, we don't put Lot in some special category that is certainly not us. Let's not forget that Lot's flesh is no different than the flesh you brought into this beautiful auditorium today. We've dressed it up, we, we've presented it in ways that are, are as good as we can, but, but the ugly truth of the matter is Lot's demise, his continual submission to what his, I believe, flesh desired is the product of what you and I have both or all retained. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, if that's the case with you, your flesh did not change one iota. Your flesh retained its ability to commit any sin that it has ever committed. And such is the case with Lot. Lot's flesh never changed. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. May I offer that you and I should not look down on another believer who has fallen into sin. Rather pray for them and reevaluate your own self, asking if you are submitting your flesh to God, or if you are submitting to your flesh. You know, we will continue to hear until Christ returns of those who hold some position of prominence who have fallen into sin. I would also submit that that is typically, while it may appear cataclysmic, it is not. It is the simple compromise it is that constant settling for something that is other than what God has intended for us. And it is possible for any person that is present today. Lot was, as it appears, continually submitting to the compromising desires of his flesh. And one commentary said it this way, Lot's heart was in Sodom long before his body arrived there. Lot should have asked, to what am I saying no? Good question. Campus Church, good question. Now, you may be seated in here today, and in fact, you may have come with the intention of just resting your body, even your eyes. But my encouragement is to not allow your mind to rest today and ask yourself an honest question. To what am I telling my flesh no? Or do I continually make these justifications for the purpose of some kind of compromise? The Bible gives us indication of where Lot was leaning. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 13, beginning in verse number 11, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. You know, you and I always fall in the direction to which we are leaning. And Lot was leaning heavily toward Sodom. And that is the very place to which he fell headlong into. The Bible, again, further in our text today, Genesis 19, beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, and there came two angels to Sodom at even. And here's Lot. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Now, when we give some further insight into that little expression he said in the gate of Sodom, we understand that that's where the city leaders are gathered. This is where the town business will occur. We get at least some indication, although maybe not confirmation, that Lot most likely holds some position of leadership in Sodom. And if he doesn't hold a position of leadership, he certainly has familiarity. He is part of those that are comfortable seated in the gate of Sodom and Lot seeing them, these two guests and Lot seeing them rose up to meet them and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground and he said, behold now my lords, turn in I pray you into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and 
and you shall rise up early and, and go on your ways. And they said, nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him and he entered into his house and he made a feast and did bake unleavened bread and, and they did eat. A couple of brief observations as we enter into our text. First of all, again, Lot seated in the gates of the city, a position of prominence. And then notice also the hesitancy of the angels. It appears that they're trying to stay at arm's length from Lot. There appears to be something about Lot that they say, no, 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 we're fine. Uh, listen, we'll just spend the night out here in the town square. Lot's like, no, sirs, this is not a good idea. And he presses upon them greatly. They seem to have some hesitancy to even go fellowship with him in his house. How different this is than when they come across Abraham. And Abraham says, now, now sit here under the shade and allow me to make you a feast. And, and they sat and he washes their feet and he begins this business of preparing a feast. Now they call lots a feast as well. Lot said, come and I'll, I'll, I'll prepare you a feast. And, and then the Bible says that he, he made them some unleavened bread and they did eat. That would be like the little wafer that we have when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. How different this is, even from the feast that Abraham prepares. He, he goes out and he prepares for them. He slays then from the, fox, from the flocks and, and he goes and he has it prepared and he prepares butter and milk and bread and what a feast. And, and Lot prepares a, a little bit of unleavened bread and presents it before them. Lot also, we might note, is a wealthy man. And then we also notice the urgency of Lot. Turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, tarry all night, wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. L listen, this is not the kind of place for you to spend the night on the streets. Lot knows that very well. And it appears that there's something about these that stood out. This is a, a simple and a silly illustration, but is there something about a believer that's supposed to be different from a non-believer? Now, I don't know that that always means we're going to look different in our dress, quite honestly. I don't know that it always means we're going to look different by, by some appearance. But isn't there something that could be qualitatively different, noticeable about a believer? So, so Julie and I, not long ago, we were out of town and I was preaching. And on the way back to the hotel, we stopped at a convenience store to pick up some waters and we walked into the convenience store and, and uh, got the, the things from the cooler and we're, we're walking back up and the guy, there are two attendants there and the guy is using profanity and, and some terrible language and then he just looks at us and he says, whoa, you guys are not from around here, are you? And um, I said, well, what makes you say that? He says, you look innocent, is what he said. I said, wow. I said, well, um, I'm a pastor. He says, ah, oh, yeah, that's it, yeah. And I said, when's the last, I said, have you ever been to church? He says, oh, yeah, 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 I've been to church. I said, when's the last time? He says, it's been a long time, okay. I said, well, more important than what you need for church is who you need, and gave him a gospel track. And, uh, you don't look like you're from around here. I wonder if you looked at Lot, if he looked like he was from around there. So we get this understanding that, oh, wow, he's seated in the gates. There's some hesitancy on the part of the angels for fellowship. There's an urgency about Lot. You can't stay there. So how does Lot get to where he was in Sodom? I don't know if he is asking himself the same question. Recently, I read this progression, the four stages of compromise. Let me mention them briefly. Number one, attraction. Something gets your attention attraction. Like, oh, wow, that, that's appealing to me. Uh, Lot, he, he views all the well-watered plain, and oh, by the way, Sodom is down there. And so he pitches his tent toward, there's something attractive that appeals to him. What is, what is it that is appealing to you right now? What has caught your eye? To, to what are you leaning right now? Well, attraction is the first thing. That something has his attention. Number two, justification. We start to create reasons for the wrongs to be okay. Justification. Oh, it's no big deal. 
There's nothing wrong with this. And we even ask this in, in a way that takes the offense. If someone were to question it, we would come on with a strong, oh, so what's wrong with it? Rather than saying, hey, this is why I'm doing this. This is what's right. We take the opposite side and we say, hey, get off my back. What's wrong with it? So we start to justify those things to which we are attracted. And then number three, indulgence. Restraints of conscience are removed or ignored. Indulgence. I find it interesting that he gives his daughters to be married to godless men. And he refers to the men of Sodom as brethren. At this point, Lot is all in. He has sons-in-laws. His daughters have married into Sodom. He calls the men of Sodom that come to do godless deeds with the guests inside his home. He says, brethren, listen, we're, we're all part of the same family here. There's some indulgence. He's all in. And then redefinition, redefinition. We redefine what is wrong. In other words, we change the question to fit the answer or we change the answer to fit whatever question. Even after the destruction of Sodom, the place to which Lot flees is not back to his uncle Abraham, but to another one of the cities of Sodom, Zoar. Even after he's instructed to flee to the mountains, he says, behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And how often do we find ourselves redefining the terms to justify what we want? We rationalize things like everybody does this. So we lie to our parents because everybody does. We call in sick when we're not really sick because everybody does. We delete our search history. We secretly meet off campus. We don't report all of our income. We listen to music that glorifies a lifestyle so contradictory to the life of Christ and we don't even blush because everybody does. We pursue money as our greatest pursuit thinking that it will provide for us the good life and we conveniently ascribe false motive to those who contradict us, demonizing them in an attempt to justify self. All of this is an attempt to ultimately get what we think we want slowly weakening ourselves through compromise. Lot's situation had been exactly the same as Abraham's. Have you ever thought about that? In Genesis 12, when Abraham left Haran, Lot went with him. They traveled together, they lived together, and I suspect they worshiped together. They both grew wealthy together. They both were men that God looked upon as righteous. But when Sodom is destroyed, Notice how differently their lives had become. Lot is being dragged out of Sodom and he pleads to be released to one of the smaller cities that were part of the Sodom and Gomorrah Confederation, attempting once again to recreate Sodom in Zoar. And where is Abraham? And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Yes, Abraham has had and will have issues of his own. But I would submit to you that the greater the compromise with sin, the greater the cost to the sinner. We've begun by looking at the compromise of the saint but let's continue by looking at what we'll call the contamination of sin. Sin does what it always does. Sin, wherever it's found, it always contaminates. It's never a healthy addition to any scenario. Sometimes we might even try to rationalize, reason, justify. Well, everybody needs to dabble in this a little bit. Or, you know what, I'm young and it's just time for me to sow my wild oats. So I'm just going to mess with sin for a little bit and kind of get that out of my system. And then I'm going to be in a lot better situation. What rationalization and what justification for sin? Sin never helps any situation. Sin always contaminates. And think about how differently the interactions these angels had, of course, with Abraham, as opposed to how they interacted with Lot. Completely different. 
a couple of things that we notice. First of all, the contamination of the sinner. The contamination of sin. Well, it's always going to contaminate, of course, the sinner. Sodom was immersed in their sin. And not only were they completely upside down in their thinking, they demanded that everyone else approve it as well. Do you understand that? Sodom is upside down in their thinking. They call good evil and evil good, right, wrong, wrong, right. everything completely upside down. But not only are they upside down in their thinking, you are going to have to approve it as well. You're going to have to put your stamp of approval on our wicked lifestyle. This is the upside down contaminating aspect of sin. The, the men that came that evening, Again, we're trying to just piece through this narrative, but think through the men that come. The Bible says that young and old, from every quarter, from every part of the city, there is a horde of men that are standing outside of Lot's home and they are clamoring to have a physical godless relationship with the two guests that are inside of Lot's home. So th this is the scenario. Think about how far sin had taken them. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. And these men do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof and they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and will he needs be a judge? Are we going to allow him to sit in our gates now? He has to approve of what we're doing. Now, will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Of course, the angels that are inside had to, had to actually apprehend him, drag him inside, and then smite the horde of people outside his home with blindness. Sodom was saying to Lot, who are you to judge us? The world says, we accept you so long as you approve us. Listen, Christian, you can get by with relatively few condemnations about the fact that you choose Jesus so long as you approve everyone else's lifestyle. Sodom typ typifies those who literally can't rest until they have done evil. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, for they sleep not except they have done mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall for they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Again, even after these men are smitten with blindness, have you ever thought about this? They're smitten with blindness, but they don't just try to stumble back to their homes. This crowd outside of Lot's home, they're continuing in their blindness to attempt to try to find some way in that they can satisfy their physical, fleshly desires. How far does sin take a person? I mean, they, they, they have just been judged, smitten with blindness, but that doesn't stop their desire. I am going to have what I want and nothing is going to stop me. Before we leave the contamination and corruption of these sinners, I think it is sadly important for us to pause and, and at least recognize what is the sin that is about to, to, that these men are clamoring for that are standing outside of Lot's home. They were clearly seeking a physical relationship with the two travelers that came under Lot's roof. And they were seeking a relationship that God has intended to be exclusively reserved for a man and a woman to be fully enjoyed and even celebrated within the protection of the marriage covenant. God's clear intention is for one man to be physically united with one woman as long as they both live. Anything other than that arrangement, God calls an abomination. It does not matter how we attempt to redefine this today. An honest look at scripture does not provide for it. 
there are many today that are trying to redefine what is it that these men were asking for. If, if anyone honestly looks at Scripture, there's absolutely no question whatsoever as to what is this sin specifically in Sodom. And the Bible addresses it all throughout. No matter how you want to redress, reframe, um, represent Scripture, the Scripture's clear. Just a few scriptures that are mentioned. Leviticus 18.22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. There is a difference between God's ceremonial laws and God's moral laws. Many people have tried to take Leviticus 18, Leviticus 19 and say, well, those are just ceremonial laws. For example, God said that you're not supposed to wear mixed fabric. God said that you're not to plow with a donkey and and cattle together. Um, You're not supposed to plant mixed seed. But God never calls that an abomination, a moral condemnation. So what God does in Leviticus chapter 18 is God says this is not a ceremonial law as in, hey, the, the law no longer has bearing on us. Ah, this is moral law which God never rescinds. Leviticus 20 verse 13, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. It's also mentioned throughout the New Testament. Romans chapter 1 beginning in verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me or which was fitting. I read an article recently where there is one who is claiming that the sin of Sodom, which we refer to today, even as sodomy, was actually their lack of hospitality their lack of hospitality, and they went further on to claim under the guise of Christianity, a a pastor who's claiming this this is Christianity, that Lot's extreme example that we don't understand culturally, but his extreme example of hospitality was that he literally offers his own daughters to the men that were clamoring at the door. Again, all done underneath the name of Christianity. This is the contamination of the sinner, but it's also the contamination of the saint. Now, as courageous as Lot is in his attempt to protect his heavenly guests, we can't overlook the incredible place to which he lowers himself as a citizen of Sodom. Genesis 19.8. Behold now, he says to these men, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. In our modern sensibilities, but I would submit to you in our mankind sensibilities, we stand back and are absolutely dumbfounded that we read about one that the Bible refers to in the New Testament as righteous, stoops so low as to say to these men, you you cannot have my guests. I have two daughters. They have not known a man. Let me send them out to you and do to them as seems good to you. How different this is from what a father should be one who is taking active steps to protect his children from anything that would harm them. Yes, our children are free moral agents with the ability to choose both right and wrong, and they do and will. But doesn't it make sense for a Christian father to do all that's in his power to protect his children from the wrong and to encourage his children to the right? So then wouldn't a Christian father be involved in how his daughter presents her body and the way she dresses or how she portrays herself through online media? or where she goes, or who she dates, and so on, all in an attempt to provide her with the protections necessary in our fallen world. And certainly, these principles would apply to the daughters and the sons of fathers just as well. And notice the contamination of his testimony. Clearly, Lot had no testimony in Sodom. He had no testimony either with his own children. 
the angel said, do you have any other family here? I know your wife is here and your two daughters are in the house, but are there any other family members, any sons out in Sodom, daughters? Yes, I I have some sons-in-law. They've married my daughters. Uh, Let me go out to them. And so Lot rushes out into the night of Sodom. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Notice this. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And with tears streaming down his eyes, he has to go back to his own home empty-handed. His, his own children, they, they, they say, he's just, he's playing a game and, and we're going to play it with him. Abraham still dwelt in a tent. Lot had a home. I wonder how meaningful the well-watered plains of Jordan that were his excuse for moving toward Sodom meant to him now. Abraham was a sojourner, Lot is a citizen, respected in the gates of Sodom. But what does that mean to him now? Lot's about to lose all that he possessed. He lost his daughters and his sons-in-law in Sodom. He would soon lose his wife, but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. The cost of living was exceptionally high in the land of Sodom. I submit it cost Lot far more than he had anticipated paying. You know, as we close, look at two cries from Sodom. Two cries from Sodom. First of all, sin is crying out. It's saying, listen to whatever your heart tells you it wants. Sin says, just follow your heart. But the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Sin cries out, laugh at whoever disagrees with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just laugh it off. I mean, you can even mock with your friend. You can walk away from someone who loves you enough to tell you the truth. A parent, a friend, a teacher. Just laugh it off because if they're going to get in your way, you just set them aside as irrelevant. Linger as long as you can. Just a little bit more. Just one more look. Just just one more touch. Just one more place. Just a little bit further. Look back with longing at what you have left behind. Like the children of Israel, no longer captive, but longing for the the leeks that were back in the, the cooking pots of Egypt. And how different this is from the call of God. God says, get up. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot saying, arise, get up. Take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. There is something urgent and God is by his messengers saying to Lot, Lot, it is time to get up and get out. It's the next thing that he says. Get up, get out, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Five times in just these brief verses, the Bible uses the expression escape, escape, escape. Listen, you have the key right now, Lot, to the door to to which you have been imprisoned. It is time for you to get out of Sodom and find a place of safety. He goes on and he says, get moving, get moving. God literally had the angels move Lot and his family to a place of safety. You know, for so many of us, God puts us in a place, sometimes kicking and screaming. Sometimes God is dragging us the whole way. But what God is doing is he's putting us in a place where, wow, I've got a little reprieve, a, a, little, a little window of grace. And God puts us in a spot where it's like, this is, this is what I've needed. And, and No, Lot didn't go willingly. He didn't hasten himself. He he didn't get up and get going. He had someone drag him. But oh, the mercy of God when he puts us in a place where now, Lord, I have a little window. And then he says, get focused. Get focused. Escape for thy life. 
Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Here God is saying, don't look back on your former life. Get focused on that which is before you. It's as if Paul is talking, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. No man putting his hand to the plow, turning back is fit for the kingdom of God. What God is saying to him right now through the angels is, listen, get out and don't look back. Oh, but the, the allure of Sodom ran so deep, its roots so penetrated her heart that even as she leaves, Lot's own wife says, oh, how I long for. The contamination of sin. Does anyone here ever ask the question, or maybe more pertinent, have you ever been asked the question, well, was it worth it? We're asked that question for a lot of different reasons. And depending on the timing of the question, the context, the answer may be absolutely. But I think if you ask Lot the question, Lot, was it worth it? You moving to Sodom? About a week before the angels arrived, he may have said, best move I ever made. I'm living the dream. I wonder how he would answer now. The compromise that Lot made was costly. He was settled in Sodom. And the question that must be asked today is, where are we settling? We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord. You can connect with us anytime at rejoicetv.org or on demand where streaming content is found. Your tax deductible gift is vital to help sustain this ministry. Your support for Rejoice in the Lord enables us to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord.